If you want to break into tech with AI or if you want to transition from software engineer to AI engineer, then this video is going to help you because I'm going to give you the roadmap with the eight most critical skills that you would need to know and the things that you would need to understand if you want to be part of this AI development. The first thing obviously will be the programming language. And in that case, all you need is Python. I'm not saying that other languages cannot handle machine learning. I'm saying that everything that can be done should be done and you would need to do can be handled with Python. The second important skill will be frameworks and libraries. Here, the traditional way is TensorFlow and PyTorch. Now in 2023, I would say you need Langchain and Hugging Face. The difference is that Hugging Face and Langchain are using already existing large language models, meaning that you can leverage on those when you're developing your own apps. However, if you're looking for AI engineering job right now, you're going to see that everybody's still looking for PyTorch and TensorFlow. Or if you're trying to build a small, large language model for your company, the data is very sensitive, then of course still you're going to need those platforms. However, if you want to start from the very beginning, Keras is the most friendly user one, the least functional as well, but it's a good beginning. Then TensorFlow is the most capable one. PyTorch is friendlier. So what I'm trying to say is that there are different options here. Would you go with traditional method or would you trust that in the future we are actually not going to be building AI models anymore and we're going to be leveraging the existing ones? Then put your head towards hugging face and lung chain. And three will be turned understand the basics of machine learning. And there are three main components, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And if you have any background in statistics or research, then you may think about deductive and inductive analysis. But either way, I'm going to just very simply explain the difference between those. Supervised learning is, for example, let's say I tell my model five categories, desserts, fruit and veggies, dairy products, meat, and liquids. And I give it 1000 items and I want to teach it to classify those items correctly into those five categories that I gave it in advance. That will be supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is if I give the model the same 1000 items and I ask it to analyze and look for patterns and then from those patterns to tell me what categories did it come up with. For example, the model may identify that a lot of products are packaged in plastic and some are in color carton box and it may create those categories instead. Basically, the difference is, am I telling the data what I'm looking for and teaching it to classify or I'm asking the data to come up with patterns and to do a cluster analysis? Reinforcement learning is when I'm teaching a model, for example, game, there are rules and every single time when the model correctly follows the rules, I reward it. I give it one point, for example. Every time when it fails to follow the rules, I deduct one one point punishment. So in that way, you can teach a model to perform in a very specific way that you wish and desire. The fourth thing that you need to become familiar with is deep learning and neural networks. Actually, just a little thing. AI is the umbrella term. Machine learning is a subset of AI. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. I do recommend you a course on Coursera because it's created by the deep learning team. It has over 800 people that have enrolled. It has very high reviews. And overall, if you look at what the certificate involves, there are like six courses there and it really covers the most important things. And don't pay attention to the three months. It's actually possible to take it into a month, which means you pay $49 to have structured learning plan and you're going to get professional certificate at the end. So yeah, I recommend you do that. You, you choose. There are two things I can help you with in that video. First is the main components of neural networks. And second is the time. We have four main components. We have neurons, we have weights, we have activation functions, and we have layers. I'm going to talk a bit more about transformers because currently the world is crazy about large language models and transformers. So then I'm going to elaborate on those components a bit more. Let me just mention the most important types. We're looking at feed forward neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and recurrent neural networks. Those are keywords. And if you go into machine learning, 
learning or AI engineering, you will be hearing those a lot and you will be working with those a lot. So again, I'm just giving you the roadmap so you know where to focus and what you have to learn instead of trying to figure out by the bunch of information over there because cognitive overload is a thing. And I hope creating such a video can actually decrease your anxiety and give you some clarity. Now let's talk a bit more about transformers. Transformer consists of encoder, bunch of layers, decoder, in simple words. The encoder takes data that is our words and converts it into a numeric format or vector that captures the meaning and the context. This encoded information is then used by the rest of the model, for example, to generate a translation. Decoders are the counterpart to encoders in the transformer architecture. And the decoder takes that encoded information and translates it back to us so that we can understand. It. What made ChatGPT so powerful is the attention mechanism. But before we talk about this, let me tell you the four main components that are required for encoder. We need word embedding, positional encoding, self-attention, and residual connections. And actually embedding is the most important term here. This is something that you really need to become familiar with if you want to follow that path. So we use word embedding network for each word or symbol. But every word, let's say, has weights and those weights are determined using backpropagation. In technical terms, backpropagation is the process of optimizing the values of each word one step at a time and that results in those final weights. And by the way, that process of optimizing the weights is the training. Self-attention helps transformers understand better the relationships between words. For example, I watched a movie on Netflix and it was good. It was good. That it part could relate to Netflix, it could relate to the movie, it could relate to the whole experience of watching a movie. So the attention mechanism is actually being able to understand the context of those words. And this is why actually it feels so intelligent because it has those keywords, which is another part of the embedding. And I'm not gonna go into details now. Those are the terminologies that you get comfortable with eventually, and they are very needed in the AI world. Now, now let's say a few words about the fact that they're actually different transformers. GPT, for example, is generative pre-trained transformer that has only decoder in its architecture. This setup enables GPT to create text that is both contextually meaningful and logically connected in a way where each word or symbol is predicted from the previous ones. By removing the encoder, the model is only concentrated on generating text, making it particularly good for tasks such as filling in text, creating new content, and creative writing. Third is bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, and it only has encoder layer. This means it leverages the section of the transformer architecture that is focused on analyzing and gasping the input information without a corresponding decoder to create new sequences. Baird's design is good at examining the connections and context within a text, considering all elements at once instead of one after the other. Consequently, Baird excels in functions that require comprehending the links among various parts of a sentence or a passage such as answering questions, categorizing text, and analyzing sentiment. And finally, we have 5T transformers, which are text-to-text -text transfer transformers. And it's designed around the idea that almost all NLP tasks can be cast as a text-to-text -text problem. The five main skill that you need to learn is data analysis. In general, data is the magic of machine learning. The more data you have, the better, but also the better quality data you have, the smarter and the more accurate your model is. As I already said, you're going to need Python for machine learning and there are three libraries from Python that you like to focus on. Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib. And I know it's a lot of information, so by the end of the video, actually I'm going to make one screen, like a screenshot, and I'm just going to put all those steps, the eight skills, at one shot so that you can actually see it, maybe screenshot it, and I, I just think it's going to be useful if I do that. The sixth thing you need to become very familiar with is natural 
natural language processing. And here there are three terms that you'll be hearing all the time, tokenization, embedding, and sentiment analysis. Tokenization is a fundamental step in natural language processing and text analysis. It's the process of breaking down a text into smaller units called tokens. We already spoke a little bit about embedding, so let's just say a few words about sentiment analysis. It's a natural language processing technique that is used to determine whether data is positive, negative, or neutral. It is often performed on textual data to help businesses monitor brand and product sentiment in customer feedback and understand customer needs. Now, it's a good thing to clarify that although I'm heavily focused on large language models, transformers in that video, you may actually decide to go for computer vision. Those things will give you a bit of different path at this point here. After Python, data analysis, deep learning, neural networks, you will actually go into slightly different direction. This is up to you. And again, I'm going to leave that link to the other general video that I've created because it's going to help you get familiar with your options. However, whatever you decide in general, the next step will be cloud computing. And here you want to focus on one of those three, Amazon, Azure, or Google Cloud. If you go with AWS, you want to focus on SageMaker. And I advise you to use Amazon Code Whisperer because it is designed to help machine learning and it's there. So why not use it? If you decide to go with Google Cloud, I recommend you check Vortex AI. This is a their AI assistant. And of course, it's well familiar with the platform and is designed again for machine learning. So it's obviously wise to learn how to use Vortex AI. And I left Microsoft Azure as last because I want to say a few more words. In fact, I actually think it's the most powerful one and I would definitely advise anybody who wants to work with AI to learn how to work with Azure. So Microsoft has had a bit of like backseat, but it's actually the most important backseat because it is who funded OpenAI. They actually build those big GPUs that are running ChatGPT. So if it wasn't for Microsoft, we wouldn't have had ChatGPT right now and probably not anytime soon because this thing requires very advanced hardware. Microsoft is also behind Meta's Llama 2. And actually, Llama 2 is really revolutionary in the sense of two things. First, they used a module or let's say a process of fine tuning called LoRa. The Llama 2 that is 70 billion parameters is actually capable of performing what a 100 billion parameters model will do. And don't quote me on that 100, but the point is that is smaller model being able to perform as a larger model due to the better, more efficient fine tuning called LoRa. And there's some other parts here as well, but I'm simplifying here. The other part why Llama is so good and so revolutionary is quantization. And this is something that you'd like to learn as well, because the thing with those large models is that they require hardware that we don't have. For example, for about 1 billion parameter, you need 1 gigabyte of RAM. So if you're having 70 billion parameters, you can run it on a 70 gigabyte byte of RAM, which we usually don't have. So quantization is just a way of dealing with memory, very simplified again. But the point is that a larger model can run on a weaker machine. Still, we need powerful machines, but not that powerful. In fact, we're talking about 26 decrease of memory size. And I'm telling you this because if you're building your own AI models, you would like to look into quantization. Finally, step number eight will be deployment and scaling. And here is where if you have been a software engineer until now, you're going to finally know what's going because on. Because your knowledge in Dockers and Kubernetes will come handy in general, knowing how to work with pipelines, knowing how to run with the architecture of a software product will really help you here. It's not that different at the stage of deployment and scaling. Maybe two things that I would like to mention here is that PyTorch, for example, has been historically worse than TensorFlow, specifically in deployment, although recently they have made an effort. Again, let me know if you want me to make a video specifically on comparing those two. And the other thing that you may want to know is that if you're trying to deploy AI models directly to customers, you probably will need to write 
right APIs. Finally, something that I would like to mention, it's not something that you will consider immediately when you're building AI models. Not that you shouldn't, but people just don't think about this right away, is ethics and biases. Yes, if you're having a product that will be serving a lot of people, you would like to look into different requirements and government restrictions. But the second thing to know is that all those models are trained on human data. Human data is always biased. We produce it. That's why the data cannot be uh, objective. Therefore, we are creating biased models. Something I was reading a couple of days ago is now they're trying to actually combat that problem by teaching new large language models data generated by a large language model because then they think if they filter the data to be more objective and not biased then the new model will also be less biased and eventually we're gonna go away from human generated data but then what is that data even? I don't know how that's gonna work. I just read about it recently. Maybe in the future we will be bias free but right now right here if you're using data generated by people it will be biased let me show you now that final screenshot I promised to show you from the beginning of the video. Here you can see those eight steps I was talking about. This is the roadmap. This is basically a direction and I hope it gives you the clarity that I think is missing right now. Thanks for watching guys. I hope this was helpful and I'm gonna see you in the next video.